Amen, family. Let's open up to Luke 18. All right, all right. You know, I'm really grateful, guys, to be back together here this morning. I'm grateful to, to join with the IE for another service. It's been a little while, huh? Uh, but I'm grateful. You know, we had a great New Year's service, uh, and we 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 got to do the countdown at the New York New York countdown together, which was great. And then we got to su- serve at the Super Bowl the very next day. Um, but it's just been a it's been a good couple weeks, and today's been an awesome service, has it not? I just want to thank the Levichefs again for your heartfelt communion. Thank you, guys. <laughs> You know, I think it it helps us with perspective because um, here you have a couple in their 40s who go through a lot of pain and raise two kids, and yet they work harder than pretty much all of us. I could say they work harder than me and Liz oftentimes, even in the midst of their pain. And I just think it's a beautiful thing that, that God would give us such a special couple in the region to leave us without excuse, yes, but to set us an example of what our potential really is. Our potential is great. Um, and it's, um, it's unfortunate that, that, you know, your example is, you know, w- w- your, your pain is our, you know, at our expense that we get to learn from your example. But um, we're just really grateful to have you guys. We're really grateful that, you, you know, you, you push through and you've discipled so many people and um, you get into so many people's lives. But what we don't know is when they feel pain and they don't tell you about it. You know, like we, we didn't think Matt or Marla was in pain even of this morning because they're here and they're giving and they're serving. Um, but that's just the level of self-denial. Um, if somebody knows you're denying yourself, then you're not denying yourself. You know what I mean? And I, I just think that there's just such a special example there that we really got to learn from. And we're really grateful. And I think that helps us to be even more considerate and compassionate of their situation. Uh, so if you don't get a phone call back right away, it's not like, oh, man, they just don't like me. Like, you know, stop being insecure. They probably have a good reason because that's not the heart that these people have. That's not the heart. They, they want to be at every meeting. They want to be strong probably more than I want to be strong. You know what I mean? They want to be strong more than all of us want to be strong. And so their desire and their heart is so pure. And so I just think we're, we got to be super grateful that we have a couple just like them. We're grateful to have the love of Jeffs, huh? Um... <clears throat> For the contribution, I'm really grateful for Refugio and Joyce doing the contribution. Um, they're, they're turning into a little a little preaching couple up here, huh? Even Refugio's got a nice little new Bible. He's not using his uh, his tablet thingy that he uses, but he's using his nice little nice little Bible right there. And they had a nice little dynamic. He's like, hey, I already have it planned out. Joyce is going to speak in verse 24 in a moment. She'll take it away. Take it away. And then she takes it away and teaches us. And it's just, it's been a good service to see new people raising up uh, and to see a new joy in our hearts. I do feel like it is a bit of a new year, given that this is a new region. Amen. Uh, I'm grateful, guys, to get into the scriptures this morning. My, my goal is to give us faith today. You know, I, I dropped the bomb on us about our special missions goal uh, on New Year's Eve that we're going to be giving $113,000 as the IE region on May 17th, by May 17th. And even when I said that again, there wasn't a lot of amens. You know, when I first said that, people were like, I'm super fired. Oh, amen. But here's the good news. You you individually don't need to give 113. You just need to contribute. Amen. We are all going to contribute together in a very sacrificial way, but we will hit that number Um, because that's what God expects us to do. You know, I've even gotten my shoulder tapped in the last couple weeks. I've even had disciples come to me and say, hey, your goal is $113,000. Wow. I mean, hey, man, amen. If you guys pull that off. Wow. Why are you guys clapping? I, what are we clapping about? People don't think we can do it. Like, I don't know about you. I'm a little competitive. So if somebody was like, you know, I don't know if you could take them. I could take them. You know what I mean? You know, what? You know, but no, but, but, but I don't think a lot of people expect us to do this. But you know who does? God expects us to do this. And immediately, most immediately, the missionaries expect us to do this. I don't think any missionary is like, hey, if you come up with it, no worries. If you don't, no worries. No, Andrew Smelly has gotten mugged and gotten robbed multiple times since he's been in Lagos, Nigeria. He has gone without food weeks on end only to feed his children and to not eat himself and his wife. 
li there's limited resources. We are not selfish Americans. We, we get to sack, we get to give to, to missions. Are you with me right here? So my goal today is to give us faith. Yeah is to give us faith. Now, it may not be a faith, faith issue. It could be a sin issue of greed. It could be a greed issue. The only obstacles that stop people from doing what God asks them to do is a lack of faith, which in and of itself, he says, if anything done without faith is sin, so that's already sin. Or there could just be an immediate, tangible sin of commission in our lives that's suffocating our ability to do God's works for him. Are you with me right here? So my goal is to get all that out of here and jujitsu the whole situation so that we can all look at the scriptures with clean eyes and with, with a fresh heart and have some fresh faith. Amen? So let's read here in Luke chapter 18. Let's read what Jesus says. In Luke 18, verse 6, he says, The Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Yes. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on on the earth. You see, everyone was wondering, hey, is this person going to get judged? Is, is there going to be justice here? This guy's an immoral leader. Is that guy going to get justice? Is that one person going to get justice? This person did this to me. Are they going to get justice? And God's saying, hey, don't worry. I'm going to come and everyone's going to get justice. Don't worry if people are going to get justice. But when I come, the real question is, am I going to find faith on the earth? Wow. Am I going to find faith? Because the denominational world has watered it down to faith being intellectual belief in Jesus and in God. I mean, let's be honest here. Agnostics believe in God. They believe in a God, but they don't live it out. They intellectually believe in something, but they don't worship it. And for us, is Jesus going to find real faith? Because faith, every time faith and belief shows up in the scriptures, the Greek is a verb. And verb requires action. So belief was never intellectual because it's like, it's as equal as me saying, I believe Taylor Janes is a person and that he exists. And that is why I get to go to heaven. Is because I believe that Jesus was a real person, that he existed, and therefore I can go to heaven. What? Like, not even atheists debate that Jesus existed. Everybody knows Jesus walked the earth. Everyone just denies that he was God in the flesh. Everyone knows he was a man and that he did miracles that no one could question. Read the Palestine. Read the Talmud. Like, these are, Jesus was a real man that walked the earth and performed miracles that no one could fathom. That's not the question. That's easy to believe. That's easy to believe. What's really hard to believe is what he stood for. What he asked all of us to do, what he came for, and what he told people to do, that's hard to believe. And he says, am I going to find a group of people that have faith on the earth? When I come back, uh, don't worry, I'll give justice to your grandmother. I'll give justice to your mom. I'll give justice to your husband. I'll even give justice to you. I'll give justice. That's not what you need to worry about. You need to worry about if you have faith. If I come back, I better see faith in this life. I better see faith in your life. And I don't want to be a region of people that Jesus comes back and he looks at us and says, oh, I don't see any faith in here. I see people that came to church. I see people that were even a little bit happy. I see people that enjoyed singing songs. But where was the faith? You see, you need faith if you can't do it on your own. So $113,000, we can't do on our own. We're not a talented region of white-collar rich people that can just front that money. We're blue-collar people, which I think is even more of an opportunity because we're a people that actually need to depend on God. Our faith actually requires God to get involved. And that's the kind of church I want to be a part of. And that's the kind of life I want to be in. I never want to be in a place where I don't actually have to need God. Because here's the thing. We all want God. And we can all admit that we need Him. But there's a little pride within all of our hearts that doesn't want to need God. So we want Him. Like, yeah, I want God. Just like I want Chick-fil-A. I want it. It's good. I can agree that it's good and I can agree that I want it. 
I can admit that I need it because I know that I'm dependent and I know that I struggle and I know that I need God. But there's a pride in my heart that doesn't want to have to need God. In the same way that as a kid, you wanted your parents, you loved your parents, you knew that you needed your parents, but you didn't want to have to need them. You didn't want to have to depend on them. There's that little spirit within us called the sinful nature. There is a spirit in you that loves God. And there is a spirit in you that hates God. And there's a spirit in you that wants God. And there's a spirit in you that does not want God. And that spirit in you that does not want God wants to suffocate every ounce of you that does want God. And the question you got to ask yourself is, which spirit are you going to feed this morning? Are you going to feed the spirit that says, yeah, I'm a disciple. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I'm one of the only few people saved on the earth. But don't count on me to save the rest of the world. How could that be? That is in and of itself a contradiction. If you're saved, then you've been called to save. And we save in one of two ways. We save here in our local city. And we save two by fundraising, plundering the Egyptians, doing whatever we got to do to scrape up every penny that we ever find and giving and committing to amounts of money that we will give to missionaries so that other places and other cities and other places can have what we have here. That's the faith that Jesus sees in this room today. That's the faith that we possess that Jesus doesn't see in other churches. He doesn't see this faith that he's actually talking about. This is the kind of faith he's talking about, a faith that challenges you, a faith that pushes you. And I pray that you have the faith this morning that's a higher faith than you've ever had this morning. It's a higher faith that you've ever had as a disciple. And I pray that you never get content with the faith that you have. I pray that you never get content with the level of faith that you've arrived to. I pray that you always push yourself to the seams and on the cusp of more. You know, this last week in my quiet times, I was playing a little bit of catch up. You know, we took, Liz and I took a trip to Oregon and we came back from the winter workshop and then we went to the winter workshop and we really didn't have time to unpack our bags. And we were just, and then immediately we got sick and then we come back and this, kind of, this week was kind of catch up week. I was playing catch up, doing grading papers on ICCM and all of our other responsibilities and cleaning the house and Peggy's got to go to the bathroom all the time and all this kind of stuff, you know. And, you know, so we're playing catch up and I'm like, you know, Lord, I, I could use some faith because I'm, I'm, I'm coming back and I'm getting in the swing of things again and I'm realizing, hey, you know, the IE hasn't grown in a while. We haven't had any growth in a while. Uh, and now you want to give us a daunting number uh, that no one of us have ever even come close to uh, in special missions. I mean, I've never been a part of a region that gave over 100 grand, you know. Um, but, I, but I was like, you know, Lord, I could use some faith. So I open up the Bible, and I, I'm reading through the Bible, and I'm going to finish it the sixth, my, my sixth time by February. And I only have a couple books left, and so I, was, I had Esther left, so I read Esther. Read the whole book of Esther. And I had a little flicker in my heart, but I'm like, I'm not feeling it. You know when you're reading and you're like, hmm, I haven't connected yet. You know what I mean? Like you can spend all day with somebody, but you did not connect with them. Like you can read the Bible and not connect. And like really latch on like, whoa, like that's it. I feel it. And I didn't feel it. So I'm like, okay, well, I got to keep going. So I turn to Zechariah. And I read the whole book of Zechariah. And I got faith reading Zechariah. I got some faith. Reading the book of Zechariah, and you're saying, I didn't know that was a book of faith. I didn't know either. <laughs> but Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes from the word of God. And as far as I checked, Zechariah is the word of God. So you can get faith in Leviticus. So don't pick and choose like a buffet where you're going to read in the morning. Just you can, and I also don't want you to, to like do like a, you know, like a Russian roulette, open it up to random. But, but I'm asking you, you can get faith from anywhere in the scripture. So let's turn to Zechariah and get some faith. Amen. I'm going to share with you some stuff I got in my quiet times. You know, I want you to repeat after me. I... I believe. I believe, I believe that. I believe that, I believe that we. I believe that we, I believe that we will win. I that we will win. And that's our title this morning. I believe that we will win. You know, I do believe that. Because to those who say, oh, wow, you know, that would be a real miracle if the IE pulls off that special mission. You're right, that would be a real miracle. And we would really be working for God and watching God work. We would really see God work if he did that. But we're, we're going to get some faith to get challenged on an individual level because I'm not approaching the region with $113,000. I'm approaching each individual with, the, with what they're capable of. If you're capable of going out and fundraising, not giving, because I don't want you to measure what you can give based off of your finances because God doesn't want your sight. He wants your faith. 
He doesn't want your reality. He wants your faith. He doesn't, hey, this is what I can do. You're right. I don't want that. God doesn't want that. He wants what you can do with him. So why don't you pledge a radical number that, and go get that? So if you're individually like Brendan, bless Brendan's heart. You know that guy is full of faith. He's going to go get like $4,000. He's going to go do it. You know my pledge. I, I'm, I'm going to pledge $10,000. <laughs> That's almost half what I make in a year. You know what I mean? And so I'm going to go do that. But I don't have that in my pocket. But it requires faith. And I'm looking at a room of people that are looking back at me that don't have the faith just yet. Can I talk to the family? And you're like, yep, you're right. <laughs> you're like, you're right. We don't, I don't have faith. You're looking, look, look at me. Look at me. Double check. I, I'm sure I don't. I know. I'm not going to lie about it. And that's okay. Because the scriptures will give us some faith this morning. Amen. I believe that we will win. And I got three points about how we're going to win. Point number one, by the Holy Spirit. Zechariah 4 Verse 6, the Lord says, so he said to me, this is what the Lord said to, to, to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my Holy Spirit, says the Lord Almighty. How will we get it done, Lord? Well, it's not going to be by might, and it's not going to be by power, it's going to be by my Spirit. That's how we're going to get it done. Point number one, by the Holy Spirit. Not by might, not by power. Those seem like similar words, might and power. But I looked it up a little bit, and commentators expressed that might actually has to do with number. could be in reference to an army or a big group of people. Not by power references to an individual's strength, an individual's resources, and an individual's connections. So he's saying, you're not going to get it done by a big group of people, and you're not going to get it done by you individually. You can't get it done with an army, and you can't get it done on your own, which is usually the, way, the route we usually take. Like, hey, if, I, if everyone does it together, then I believe we can do it. Or sometimes you look at something, and you're like, well, if you can't do it, then I'm just going to do it myself. Yeah. Right? And you know, there was a sinful part of my heart, I got to confess, there was a simple part of my heart a couple weeks ago when I saw the $113,000. I was like, I'll just raise it on my own then. I'm like, yeah, right. You know, but I'm like, fine, I'll just, I'll just fundraise it. You know, and then I was like, wait a second. That's Satan telling me, hey, you should do other people's Christianity for them. No, no. God said, no, you need to distribute it. Guys, right now, can I be honest with the family? Yes. We have a $113,000 goal. The pledges we have so far, some of you have not even pledged, and you've got to really please pray yeah. and get serious and give a pledge. And the pledges we have so far is $44,000. We have $54,000 with my $10,000 pledge, but amen. We have $44,000 in pledges with a $113,000 goal. These missionaries need this, and we will give this money. They expect it. They expect it. And we will give it. So we need people to get crazy radical. So I'm scaring you in the beginning so that I can give you faith. Amen. Because I'm telling you the facts. I want to talk to you as the family. I'm telling you the facts. I'm trying to tell you the facts. But let's get some faith. Not by might, nor by power, but by the Holy Spirit. By the Spirit. And you know, you wonder, you say, you think you have the Holy Spirit this morning. You're like, hey, I got the Holy Spirit. Okay, if you have the Holy Spirit, I got to ask you, does it make you more holy? Because if it doesn't make you more holy, it's not the Holy Spirit. Are you with me right here? We have the Holy Spirit and it helps us. It, the Bible says it's our counselor and it's our helper. It's our teacher. And it will spur us on to do, the, and in the same way it's like Jesus' conscience, like James 5 says, it will teach us and lead us to do what Jesus would want to do. Do you believe Jesus could get $113,000? Are you with me right here? He could do it. So if we all have the Holy Spirit and we are all carrying the Holy Spirit, we should have upwards of over 70 little Jesuses and Jesus' consciences and Jesus' attitudes and Jesus' mindset running around capable of doing this. To say I can't do it is to say I don't have the Holy Spirit. So I want to push you on that. You have the Holy Spirit, which is the most dangerous weapon on the planet. 2 Timothy 1.7 says the spirit is the spirit of power, the spirit of love, and the spirit of self-discipline, which are the three things the whole world is looking for. The whole world is biting each other, crawling on each other's backs, and stabbing each other to get positions of power. And the Bible says you got it when you got baptized and got the Holy Spirit. The whole world's looking for love. Everybody's cheating on each other and then getting married and then getting divorced and then going after another relationship and going again and then going after substance abuse because they're trying to find love. 
love and you got it when you got baptized and got the Holy Spirit. And the whole world's looking for self-discipline. They're saying, hey, you should do intermittent sleeping and then you should take these supplement pills and then you should shape your body and then you got to do this and then you got to do that and you should just find a way to control your body and get this planner and get that planner. Well, the whole world's looking for self-discipline and you got it when you got the Holy Spirit. You have what the whole world is looking for. You are the most dangerous people on the planet and we sometimes tell God what we can do. And we tell God, hey, here's what I can do with the infinite capabilities you gave me. Here's what I can do with the spirit and the son that you put inside me. Here's my limitations. And that's not Christian speech at all. That's not godly speech at all. It's not by might and it's not by power, but it's by the spirit. You know, it's fun to have faith. It's really fun to have faith. It's better than being faithless. Being faithless stinks. You've been there before when you just, every, you're negative about everything. And you're like, I don't know if I, this, I don't know if this can work. I don't like that. I don't believe that. And you can find something negative about everything. You walk in a room and you're like, that could be different. This could be different. She didn't, she didn't come on time. He didn't say that. He didn't sing my song. You know, he messed up the note. You know, or, or you, what, you look around, you get negative about stuff, and it's just you get in this pool of discouragement, and you're not looking through the lenses of how Jesus looked at stuff. And it, you got you to gotta fight to look at what the Spirit wants you to look at. It's fun to have faith. And you know that you really have faith when no one can influence you to believe otherwise. You know that that's your real faith. Because if anyone can come in and say, hey, you know, you can't, if you believe we can hit special missions, and someone comes in and says, hey, I don't know if you can do it, and you're like, yeah, I don't know if we can, then you never really had faith. You were on a bandwagon. Are you with me right here? We got to have real faith. Where does faith come from? Romans 10, 17. It says, faith comes from hearing the word of God. But you know what I love about that verse? It says, consequently, faith comes from hearing the word of God. There's a consequence to hearing scripture. Why? Because when you hear it, it gives you faith. It's inevitable. It gives you faith. It's an, you, you hear it and you're like, wow, I, I believe. But here's the consequence. is James 2 says you can't have faith without deeds. The consequence is that faith spurs you and it stirs you and pushes you to do things. And the only way you can read scripture and still not have faith is sin. You got sin in your life. Are you with me right here? Because Romans 1, verse 5 says, obedience comes from faith. And so if you choose to obey and you're an obedient disciple, you must have some faith. If you're disobedient, you're faithless. You see, when somebody doesn't feel like they can overcome sexual impurity, it's a faithlessness. They're living in disobedience, but they have no faith. When somebody just can't let go of a substance, it's a faithlessness. When somebody can't stop lying, it's a faithlessness. When somebody can't seem to buckle down and show up on time and they just can't get their life on straight and get, get things in order and set an alarm clock and be honest with themselves and wake up, it's a faithlessness that they don't believe that they can do it. But you have to remember, you have the Holy Spirit. You got the Holy Spirit. I hope that you use the Holy Spirit and let it use you. You know, how are we going to get this? How are we going to get this done? Point number two, let's go to chapter eight. I believe that we will win by the Holy Spirit and point number two, by determination. By determination. You know, I love verse six and, and chapter eight, verse six. He says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. It, it may seem marvelous to the remnant of this people at that time, but will it seem marvelous to me, declares the Lord Almighty. He says, you know, I'm going to build a temple and people from all nations are going to stream to it and people are going to come here and they're going to build it. I said, he even previously said, I'm going to bring 10 different tribes of languages that are going to come help you build this and people are going to look at it and it's going to seem marvelous to some people. But will it be marvelous to me? You know, so often we look at things and we're like, oh, that's awesome. But does God think it's awesome? Oh, I'm intimidated by that. Is God intimidated by that? I believe that. Does, does God believe that? Is that what God would want? 
And you got to side with God because God always wins and God is victorious. Jesus gets the victory. It's all about Jesus. We're, we're, we're sanctified by the blood of the lamb, right? And by the word of our testimony, Revelation 12. So as long as the word, as long as the blood of the lamb means something to you, and as long as you have a testimony of sharing what Jesus has done in your life, you'll be victorious. Are you going to side though? Who's really going to win this battle of $113,000? Is Jesus going to win or is Satan going to win? Whose team are we really on? Are you with me right here? We have to side on the right team. You know, there's a practical way I believe we can all be determined. And there's a practical, tangible way we can all put before God that he may use our efforts and bless our efforts. Read with me in chapter 8, in verse 14. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Just as I had determined to bring disaster upon you and showed no pity when your fathers angered me, says the Lord Almighty. So now I have determined to do good again and to Jerusalem and Judah. Do not be afraid. These are the things you are to do. Speak the truth to each other and render true and sound judgment in your courts. You know, it says, hey, just as I was determined to bring disaster on you, now I'm determined to do good. Everyone's determined. You just got to ask yourself, what are you determined to do this morning? Are you determined to gather with God or scatter with God? Are you going to scatter God's people and scatter what God's trying to do or gather what God's trying to do? You know, he gives us a tangible way. He says to the people, this is how you're going to do it. If you want to get determined with me, this is how you would do it. Zechariah 8 verse 18 he says again the word of the Lord Almighty came to me this is what the Lord Almighty says the fasts of the fourth fifth seventh and tenth months will become joyful and glad occasions and happy festivals for Judah therefore love truth and peace uh oh we didn't see that coming he said the fasts the multiple fasts not one fast because Isaiah says if you fast for a day you're not fasting at all multiple fasts and multiple different months a fast that stings a little bit you know one of the fastest ways to get God's attention is to fast fasting is one of the fastest ways to get God's attention because it's you subtracting something in your life to ask God to add something into your life and you want to subtract it so that God can replace it with what you really desire so here's the thing who here knows I like coffee Who's ever seen me at Sunday service without a coffee? Exactly. Without, uh, well, amen, amen, amen. <laughs> who knows that I like thrift stores? Stan knows, amen. And who knows I love to eat out? Amen. I am fasting from coffee. I'm fasting from thrift stores. I'm going to any thrift store. And I love thrift stores. And I'm fasting from all eating out. And even Refugio tried to come up to me earlier and punk me. And he says, what if I buy it for you? Then is it eating out? I was like, that's cheating. That's cheating. Because then I could go to tap everyone's shoulder and say, hey, will you buy me food? Will you buy me food? Will you buy me food? No, no, no. It's a hard fast. Fast means to hold, cover, the word fast means to cover your mouth and refuse. It's a refusal. And so I will fast from eating out coffee and going to all thrift stores until May 17th, our special mission Sunday. Why? Because I'm serious. Do you sense any hesitation in my voice? I'm serious. I want to have faith. And I want to subtract that stuff out of my life to ask God to give me his miracle and to work through me. I would rather, I would rather get rid of that and suffer for a few months and watch God work than to sip a few coffees and not feel used by God. Are you with me right here? By determination. You know, I want to challenge you. Pick something radical to fast from and tell special missions on May 17th. And it's got a sting. If you can go a whole day without actually realizing that you were fasting, then it's obviously not a big enough part of your diet. Like you need to fast from stuff like meat, from sugar, from bread, from cheese. We all like cheese. Fast from something that's going to hurt. Something that God is going to feel. Something that God will look down and say, really? And you know what it is too. You know exactly what it is. Because if you don't have faith, that's when I got to fast. When I don't have faith, it's time to fast. Because fasting, I don't know about you, when I fast, I think a lot clearer. And I get a lot more dependent. Because I wake up in the morning, and I'm like, I go to make my cup of coffee, and I'm like, no, no. And I got to set it down. And then it reminds me, I have to pray. Because I want something more than I want coffee. And then I went to Denny's. We had D time with Tim and Leanne Kernan. I went to Denny's with, with Liz and with Tim and Leanne Kernan. They were all eating at Denny's and they're all eating a bunch of pancakes and burgers in front of my face. And I just, 
sat there. Because I started this fast as soon as I read the scripture on, on Thursday. Because I hope that we don't read scripture and keep skimming over it. I pray that you imitate it and obey it. I saw a challenge right before me and I told me right here, hey, you need to fast from something radical. I said, amen. I'll start now then, amen. I'll just start now, amen. And I had to sit there and people are like, why are you not eating? Why are you not eating? Do you feel like you're fat? Do you, do you, or is it a New Year's resolution thing? No, it's a God thing. It's my faith issue thing. It's the thing that I want to get God's attention for. I'm trying to fast because I want to get fast attention from God. And I want to be used by him. So please stop asking me questions. Otherwise, I'll eat your burger right off the spot. <laughs> But you know, guys, I, I really think it's important. Most fasting, I think, is just religious dieting. Because if you fast and don't pray, you're on a diet. You're on a diet. And you're like, oh, I've been fasting from this. Well, no, you're just probably dieting from that. And you're using God's name to cover it up. Like, no, you need to actually fast. Something that makes you get fast for the mission. Something that quickens your spirit. Something that wakes you up and you feel the absence of. So if you, I mean, one time I fasted for a couple months from meat and I felt the absence. I was like, wow, I don't realize how much meat I eat. I'm a full on carnivore. I don't even realize how much meat I eat. You know what I mean? And, and I, I, you, you pick a fast, something that's going to sting. And I challenge you with that. Pick something that you're going to fast from. Amen. Let's keep going. In chapter 10. <clears throat> you know what? We'll skip and go to point three. I believe that we will win, point one, by the Holy Spirit, point two, by determination, and point three, by blamelessness. Look at chapter 11, Zechariah chapter 11, verse 17 says, Woe to the worthless shepherd who deserts the flock. It says, woe to those worthless people, those worthless shepherds. You know, the whole world is suffering from selfish shepherds, people that are pulpit pimps, and they don't actually get up here and give nutrients to the people. They don't care for the people. They don't disciple people. They don't get into people's lives. They're absolutely selfish. Yeah. They're absolutely selfish pastors. People that are no pastors of all, they shouldn't even use God's name. They're selfish shepherds, and they're worthless. The whole world is suffering from shallow services. Services that don't push you and services that don't actually impact your heart and call you to do something great. They just tickle your ears and make you feel warm. And the whole world is suffering. Number four, the third thing they're suffering from is starving sheep. A, a pasture of God's flock, his people, who are supposed to be coming to church and learning and growing and falling deeper in love with God. And they're starving. And he says, woe to you, worthless shepherds. And I saw that scripture and I said, God, I will not be a worthless shepherd. If I'm not here to help this region give them faith, then what am I here for? If I'm not here to help us obtain tasks that God asks, then why am I here? If I'm not here to help us all fall deeper in love with God, then what am I doing? I'm worthless. And if you're a Bible talk leader and you don't help your people, you're worthless. If we ask ask ourselves to be God's people and ask to get into heaven and ask for all the benefits of the kingdom, we got to do the work. And if God asks great things of us, woe to us if any of us are worthless. You know, I, I will not be a worthless shepherd. I had to repent of my faithlessness. I had to repent and say, you know what, God, you're bigger than that. You're greater than that. And I believe you can do it. You know, I've never seen somebody rob God and get away with it. And if you think you can be a disciple but not give missions and, or give a, a tiny little amount that doesn't really affect your paycheck at all, doesn't really affect your finances at all, and you know that you're robbing God, you're not going to get away with it. Not because of any consequences I'm going to give you. Don't be afraid of the one who doesn't have the power to send you into hell or not. Have the, have the fear of the one who has the power to send you to hell or not. Don't fear the one who can kill you. You know what I mean? That's what Jesus says. Don't fear somebody. Don't fear man. Fear God. Uh, this is a God issue. It, you jump, I want to jump on board and say, God, tell me the number. Then it's not what I can, it's, here's not what I can do. It's, hey, what does it cost? That's the heart all disciples got to have. Let's go to chapter 13. By blamelessness, chapter 13, cleansing from sin. It says, on that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from the sin, of, from the sin and impurity. And on that day, I will banish the names of the idols from the land and they will be remembered no more, declares the Lord Almighty. I will remu remove both prophets and the spirit of impurity from the land. 
You know, God will remove all sin from us. And I dare say we won't be able to accomplish this if we're not blameless. You know, Psalm 119 says, Blessed are they whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are they who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. We all emphasize seeking God with all your heart. And so you read and pray as much as you can in the morning. But what if you're not blameless? What if, you, what if you habitually are a man and a woman who takes double looks at the opposite sex? What if you take double looks? You will not be able to be blessed. You will not be able to be happy. What if you know that you, you, you habitually don't want discipling and you run from discipling because you're super prideful? What if you run from getting discipling? You run from your D times. You run from your discipler. You don't fight to actually grow spiritually. You're not happy. What if you know that you're holding your finances to an extent that is, is sinful. You can't be happy either. What if you know you're not waking up on time and you're addicted to your snooze button? You hate your alarm. If you hate your alarm so much, then why do you keep wanting to hear it eight times? You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? If you hate it so much, then just listen to it once, you know? You can't be happy if you're not blameless. And I'm not trying to sell you happiness this morning. I'm trying to sell you righteousness before God. Happiness is a byproduct of being close to God and being blameless with God. And I got to tell us, guys, we got to cleanse ourselves from sin. We got to have faith. Good if you have faith. Great. If you pick up a great fast, a radical fast, good if you have a radical fast. But if you continue to live in sin, I don't want any of us to try to build up the kingdom and lose our own souls in the process. And we've seen way too many people who got us into the kingdom who are no longer here anymore. The people that we saw once build the kingdom lose themselves in the process. And I just want you to accept the warning signs that you've seen. You're here? Good. Praise God. But take the warning signs that we got to be blameless people. Amen? You know, I want to give you a challenge. I want you to really rethink a radical goal in the thousands of your special missions. For the married couples, we're all going to lead the way. Rethink a goal that you're going to pray through, and it is not going to be based off your budget, and it's not going to be based off your paycheck, and it's not going to be based off of what anything you already have in the account or that you will have in the account in the next four months. That is not what God wants. He doesn't want your tiny little paychecks of sight, the stuff that is easy to give. He doesn't want your leftovers. He wants the first fruits. So he wants you to decide a goal that you can't give without him, that you can't give on your own that you would have to pray about and we need it and we're going to call through everyone again because we have to call this is what all of the LA church is doing don't get mad at me this is what everyone's doing all of LA is done with this by the way all the other regions have covered their goals and pledges and the IE is the only one left and you wonder why people are saying yeah well, I mean, you're probably not going to be able to do it no that's my people that's my region these are God's people we're going to absolutely do that and I'll, I'll talk to them and we'll get a team effort here and we'll go do this We'll absolutely go do this. I believe that we will win. You got to believe that we're going to win. We can win. Are you with me right here? How are we going to win? Point one, by the Holy Spirit. Point two, by determination. And point three, by blamelessness. You know, you should feel challenged this morning. You may say, I feel challenged. And I hope you don't walk out and say, oh man, that was good. I felt challenged. The question is not, were you challenged? The question is, were you changed? Are you going to change? Are you going to accept the call? Repeat after me. I, 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 believe. I believe. I believe that. I believe that we. I believe that we will win. I believe that we will win. To God be the glory. Thanks and God bless.